Hello everyone. In the last uh, lecture, in fact the first lecture uh, in this particular uh, course, we uh, started discussing about the, uh, the needs and concepts that are related uh, to characterizing the pavement materials uh, in the laboratory. We also started, just started discussing about soil uh, as a pavement material and as I mentioned that we will continue our discussion uh, further uh, by understanding the soil as a pavement material and today we will also touch upon the uh, introductory uh, portion related to uh, particle size distribution of uh, soil. So, just to continue what we were discussing, we mentioned that soil can be divided into various categories. Uh, soil can be of inorganic as well as organic uh, nature and if it is inorganic uh, nature, it is usually decomposed from the parent material and it appears in the surface of the earth. So, uh, finally, soil is a mixture. So, if you take any soil, it will not be probably only from one source, it will be a mixture. It will be a mixture of inorganic and organic matter and these matters might have accumulated in the soil from different sources. Now, when I see a soil, how do I say whether the soil is inorganic or the soil is organic? It depends on the proportion of the inorganic and organic uh, ingredients that are present in the soil. So, soil in which the inorganic ingredients of mineral matters are more or dominant uh, in comparison to the organic material, they are usually called as inorganic soils. But if the organic uh, materials are dominant, they will be called as organic soils. So, uh, the organic soils, they are not desirable as a pavement construction material and they appear to be dark brown in color and they have very characteristic smell. One interesting uh, thing about organic uh, soil is that uh, many of the organic soils are very good for you know uh, improving the fertility of the soil. However, uh, the its use in, in pavement construction uh, is uh, restricted because these type of soils they have a tendency to uh, you know change the volume uh, significantly with change in moisture content and this can uh, significantly harm the stability of the pavement structure. Usually soil lacks homogeneity, it is an inhomogeneous mass as I mentioned it is a mixture uh, and this inhomogeneity can be in terms of compaction characteristics, uh, can be in terms of cohesion characteristics two soils can have very different cohesion characteristics, two soil can have very different compaction characteristics in terms of particle size distribution, two soils can have varying particle size distribution depending on the source, uh, depending on the way the soil was built up uh, uh, etcetera. So, you know these uh, heterogeneity in the soil, it makes soil very as a very unique material if you talk about construction and also a very critical uh, material to uh, understand in the laboratory because the pavement structure has to rest on this material. So, if this material is not understood properly in the laboratory or if we miss out some of the critical uh, components of analyzing this material in the laboratory, this can lead to a failure in the pavement uh, construction or the pavement structure. Okay, so, now let us see uh, or let us start talking about the uh, basic characteristics of the soil and let us begin by talking about uh, the uh, division of the soil uh, based on their sizes. And when I am saying the size of the soil here, because as I already mentioned that soil is a mixture. So, in that particular mixture, I am looking at the maximum particle size that is available and based on the maximum particle size, I am going to divide the soil into different categories. So, uh, depending on the size, it can be categorized as uh, boulders and cobbles. So, boulders and cobbles are soil uh, particles uh, with size more than 75 mm. Then we have gravels. Gravels are those soil particles whose size ranges from 4.75 mm to 75 mm. Some of the specification also use 2 mm as the uh, dividing criteria rather than 4.75 mm. So, they say that greater than 2 mm and less than 75 mm are gravels. Uh, if we consider that it is 4.75 to 75 mm, we can further divide uh, the gravels as coarse gravels. So, coarse gravels are those whose uh, size ranges from 19 mm to 75 mm, whereas uh, they are fine gravels if the size ranges from 4.75 mm to 19 mm. 
Uh, as I mentioned uh, that some of the specification uh, have divided gravels into two category uh, into three categories rather than two categories that is coarse, medium and fine. Okay. Then we have sand whose size ranges from 75 microns to 4.75 mm to 4.75 mm. So, under this we can further have coarse sand which are materials whose size ranges from 2 mm to 4.75 mm. We have medium sand whose size uh, ranges from 475 uh, micron uh, to uh, 2 mm. So, some of the specification has used this as 420 0 0.425 mm also and we have fine sand uh, that are uh, larger than 75 micron, but smaller than 0 0.475 mm or 0 0.425 mm all right. Uh, further we have silt which are you know further smaller particles whose size ranges from 0 0.002 mm to 75 microns and further uh, below we have clay uh, which are particles which are which have size less than 0 0.002 mm. Now, some of the salient features based on these sizes are that boulders and cobbles or gravels they are granular and in, in fact sands they are granular particles and they do not have cohesion. They do have internal friction they have the capability to interlock uh, with each other but they, they do not have cohesive properties between the particles. Now, the cohesive properties start building up in the soil from silt. So, silt is the first category based on size which has some cohesion in it and silt can have materials both from organic as well as inorganic origin depending on the source. These two categories including uh, boulders, cobbles, gravels, sands and uh, you know silt they are more of spherical in nature if we see the uh, shape of the uh, soil particles in it they are more of spherical in nature. Uh, on the other hand clay which is the lowest category they have more of flattened and elongated shape they have very high specific surface area and they have chemically active surface. Now, this chemically chemical active surface also makes uh, the clay as one of the very uh, peculiar material and very critical material when we uh, see them from the perspective of uh, pavement construction. For example, uh, they, they basically attract hy uh, hydrogen ions, they attract hydrogen ions when they come in contact with the moisture. Uh, in fact, uh, they attract uh, you know sodium and calcium ions when uh, basically they are stabilized or we use some form of stabilizing agents. Talking about the high specific surface area uh, in clay, uh, you know one of the literature sources states uh, that if you try to compare uh, different types of soil particles, then 1 gram of clay has almost uh, 90 uh, billion particles, whereas 1 gram of this is clay whereas 1 gram of silt has almost 5.5 million particles whereas 1 gram of coarse sand has only 700 particles. So, this tells us that in you know uh, per unit weight uh, how, how many materials can be accommodated and uh, you can see that you know in clay we can have a very huge quantity of material indicating uh, the uniqueness of its uh, size and the specific uh, surface area. Now, clay has usually medium to high plasticity that depends on the type of minerals that are present in clay. For example, you know one very uh, specific mineral is Mont Morillonite. So, such type of clay has high plasticity they are not very desirable for uh, use in as a foundation layer in the pavement. Whereas, some of the other minerals like kaolinite they are more stable in nature. But uh, it is it's also very interesting to note that in general in, in, in general we do not characterize the uh, you know soil based on their chemical or mineralogical properties which are more difficult to determine rather than we use indirect measurements which we will be discussing uh, further through our discussion uh, which are used indirectly to you know um, to uh, get an idea about the behavior uh, of the soil about the plasticity characteristics of the uh, soil. Anyway, so as I mentioned that clay has 
medium to high plasticity. Uh, it has very high strength in dry state and it is very weak in presence of moisture, especially in presence of excessive moisture. Uh, and those uh, clay particles which have very high expansive nature or shrinkage characteristics like they change their volume drastically with increase and uh, you know increase and reduction in uh, moisture content needs to be first stabilized before they can be used as a uh, uh, for the construction of um, as a foundation material in pavement construction. All right. So, one of the important point uh, here to remember is that soil exclusively do not belong to any category even depending on the sizes. So, as I said soil is a mixture. So, it can be a silty sand for example, it can be a sand gravel soil etcetera. So, it can be a combination of two to three different types of uh, 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 types of materials which we have just defined based on the sizes. Okay. Now, some of the other names of soil which uh, you can find in various specifications or uh, textbooks uh, they are as follows. For example, you can you will read about loam. So, loam is, basi is basically nothing but a type of clay soil having the properties which we have already discussed. So, this is just a terminology. We have another terminology like uh, loess. So, this is uh, soil from the uh, aeolian origin. Uh, for example, like uh, the one we talk about like calcitic material or uh, sand dunes uh, which, which comes uh, which gets transported through winds. Uh, then we have peat. So, peat is basically a decomposed form of soil which we get from the vegetation matter. This type of soil has very high moisture retention capacity and very high compressive characteristics and therefore, they are not at all, at all suitable for the uh, use in foundation layer. Okay. So, uh, due to so much complexity heterogeneity associated with you know different categories of soil which we have been discussing, it is important as I already mentioned in the, uh, in the, in the last lecture that a thorough investigation should be carried out in the laboratory before you can use the soil for construction because you have to remember the entire pavement structure has to rest on the foundation which is made up of soil. So, you have to ensure that that particular material has desirable properties. So, now let us start our discussion on uh, particle size distribution. Now, particle size distribution it is uh, one of the most important physical characteristics of the soil because, uh, because the particle size distribution uh, in any given soil mass it tells us about various, um, various strength properties, various functional properties or we cannot say it exactly tells us, but it gives us an indication uh, about the strength characteristics, about the functional characteristics of that particular soil mass. So, uh, particle size uh, distribution can be done uh, through sieve analysis. So, in the particle size distribution what we do basically, uh, we are trying to see that what is the corresponding to the different sizes of particles corresponding to different sizes of particles present in that soil mass. I am trying to see what is the percentage passing each particular size. Uh, what do I mean by this? Let us say that uh, in that particular soil mass we have soil particles of the size of 4.75 mm let us say or we have soil particles of size of 2.36 mm all right. Uh, and uh, let us say we have taken 100 gram of the soil mass and say that uh, when we take a sieve, we will talk about sieve analysis, when we take a sieve, uh, we allow the material to pass uh, through this 2.36 mm sieve, uh, we see that how much material gets retained and how much material actually passes. So, the percent passing is basically calculated as weight of the solids smaller than D in our case let us say we are trying to see that uh, what is the percentage passing 2.36 mm sieve. So, here D will be equal to 2.36 divided by total weight of the solid. So, if we have taken 100 gram of soil in that 100 gram when we passed it through 2.36 mm sieve let us say that um, 70 gram of the material passed through 2.36 mm sieve and 30 gram got retained which means 30 gram of the sample have uh, sizes 
uh, have size more than 2.36 mm and 70 gram of the sample had a size uh, smaller than 2.36 mm. So, the percentage finer than 2.36 mm will be, so percentage finer here in case of 2.36 mm, it will be equal to how much? Uh, the weight of solid smaller than 2.36, so 70 grams divided by total weight, so 100 into 100. So, you see that we have 70 percent of the material that are finer than 2.36 mm and accordingly corresponding to the, to the uh, 2.36 mm sieve, I have to mark 70 percent and I get one particular point. Similarly, for other different sizes also I will do the uh, same procedure and I can get percent passing through different size uh, sizes of uh, particles in the soil mass. Okay. So, <coughs> The sieve analysis is typically done uh, uh, when the uh, total amount of uh, when we have you know less than uh, 10 percent material passing 75 micron sieve. The reason uh, being that particles which are smaller than 75 microns they are mostly as we have discussed in the last lecture are uh, basically silt and clay particles. Now, these particles if the amount of particles are more then what may happen that especially if you talk about clay particles, they have surface charge, they are very small in size, they have surface charges, they can get, uh, they attract other particles. So, they, they can stick with other particles of similar size and they also have a tendency to stick with particles of larger sizes. So, let us say if they stick together in this form and we do a conventional sieve analysis. Uh, though the individual materials are very small, but when we are taking a sieve of a particular size, this entire uh, flock it will get retained here. But ideally, they should have passed because they have they contain individual uh, smaller sized particles. That is why uh, in those soils which have considerable amount of filler or materials passing 75 micron sieve, uh, the conventional sieve analysis may not work. Uh, now. Uh, it can as I said it can also get attached to other particles, it can get attached to the sieve itself. So, that is why the calculation of weight becomes difficult and inaccurate and we end up uh, doing wrong calculations and finding out the wrong percentage passing. So, the conventional sieve analysis is mostly applicable for uh, more coarser particles uh, specifically if the soil mass has less than 10 percent material passing 75 micron sieve. If the soil mass has more than 20 percent material passing 75 micron sieve, then we have to go for uh, sedimentation analysis. Before discussing sedimentation analysis, as I was discussing about uh, the sieve analysis, let me just uh, show you some of the sieves uh, which I have with me presently, just to give you an idea about how sieves look like. So, you see th this is a sieve, uh, you can see we have square apertures here corresponding to a specific size. So, this is basically a 19 mm sieve uh, in my hand. Similarly, uh, for different sizes because our soil mass will have particles of different sizes. So, I am interested to know uh, what are those different sizes. So, these are some standard uh, sieve sizes which are defined by the highway agencies. For example, in India 19 mm is one of the, um, one of the standard sieve. Similarly, we have another sieve. So, this sieve in my hand, this is a 4.75 mm sieve. So, you can see that the uh, size of the uh, aperture is uh, you know smaller than the previous one. So, this is a 4.75 mm sieve, again one of the standard sizes. Then we can have further smaller sizes. For example, if I am interested to know the percentage of silt and clay particles, I use a 75 micron sieve. So, you can see that how fine this mesh is and then below this typically in the sieve analysis below this we typically use a pan uh, which is not a sieve, but a collector. So, the uh, total material uh, can be collected in the pan and the corresponding weights uh, retained in different sieves and then the pan will give us the percentage passing uh, various sieve sizes. Okay. So, uh, this is about sieve analysis. <coughs> so, this is shown here and then I was, as I was saying if the soil mass has very considerable amount of uh, materials passing 75 micron and I am interested to know the sieve size distribution because probably the sieve size distribution is going to affect the stability uh, of the structure for which I am using the soil, I have to do a, uh, I have to go for 
sedimentation analysis. So, uh, specifically it is not called as sedimentation analysis, uh, but we call it as um, sieve size distribution or particle size distribution using a uh, hydrometer method. But the hydrometer method is based on the uh, principles of sedimentation and that is what we are uh, going to discuss. So, uh, this is a uh, laboratory picture uh, of uh, sedimentation or hydrometer analysis in progress uh, and ultimately what we get uh, is the uh, percent finer and as I said we plot it in a graph where in the y axis we have percent finer and in the x axis we have the particle size. Uh, one point which I missed that usually this scale is a log scale. So, it is it is a semi log graph where the y axis is arithmetic scale and the x axis is a uh, logarithmic scale all right. And then we uh, corresponding to different sizes we plot the graph and try to see try to analyze the graph visually to understand what type of soil it is what um, characteristics this soil may have all right. We will discuss more about the graph in the subsequent slides. So, uh, as I said that these are some of the reasons that the smaller particles will have surface charge, they have the tendency to stick with each other with other particles for which we cannot use the conventional sieve analysis. So, now let us because you see conventional sieve analysis using sieves they are more easy to understand which means this particular method it is very straightforward. Uh, but the uh, theory behind uh, hydrometer analysis is a little more intense I can say and it is uh, sometimes to students it appear to be very confusing when they are trying to analyze the materials you know smaller than 75 microns and trying to understand the hydrometer analysis. So, let us uh, try to spend some time in understanding this procedure. So, before I jump into the exact procedure of using the hydrometer analysis for sieve size distribution of uh, you know particles smaller than 75 microns, uh, let me try to explain you something about the sedimentation a process or the or the theory of sedimentation we use in the hydrometer analysis. To define sedimentation, sedimentation is basically uh, a behavior of uh, solid particles of a particular size in which they have a tendency to settle down in a solid suspension due to various forces acting on it or in any suspension uh, due to various forces acting on it. So, uh, which means that if I take a beaker and if I fill it with water and I if I just allow a soil particle to drop inside. So, it will have a tendency to settle down ok because of different forces acting on it. So, uh, let us try to first understand that what are the forces, what is the equilibrium condition and then uh, based on the uh, Stokes law how do we you know use uh, how do we you know uh, define a relationship uh, between uh, you know various uh, parameters related to the movement of this particle inside this solution. So, uh, the concept of sedimentation as I said is based on Stokes law. So, if you try to see a particle here, if you try to see a particular particle here. So, what will be the forces acting on this particle? The forces acting on this particle will be the weight of this particle. Then since this is a liquid we will have a buoyant force and we will also have a drag force acting on it all right. So, uh, I hope we understand that buoyant force is basically a function of the difference in pressure which is at the top and at the bottom if this is h 2 if this is h 1. So, this is rho g h 1 this is rho g h 2 and this difference create the buoyant force and the force is equal to the weight of the water displaced by the equal volume of solids. Okay, and then we have the drag force which is a resistive force uh, acting in the opposite direction. Okay, so, in equilibrium condition what will happen? <coughs> so, this is the drag force, this is the buoyant force, this is the weight of the particle. When the equilibrium condition is achieved this particle will be moving at a constant speed inside that particular um, solution. So, in that situation we can write that in equilibrium condition B plus D will be equal to W ok or let me write it as that W will be equal to of the solid will be equal to B plus D ok. Now, we know the general relationship between uh, specific gravity weight and volume. So, specific gravity uh, or, or the density or the unit weight is basically equal to 
the weight divided by volume. So, I will use this particular relationship. So, here I can write W s s gamma s into the <coughs> volume of the particle. If I am considering the particle to be a spherical particle, which is the basic assumption uh, for the derivation of the Stokes law, it will be equal to 4 by 3 pi r cube, all right, where r is the radius of the particle. Buoyant force becomes equal to again the unit weight of water into the equal volume of water which is displaced by the solids. So, it is gamma w into the uh, volume which is again 4 by 3 pi r cube. All right. So, and drag force it can be derived uh, for spherical particle flowing inside uh, the uh, solution uh, it is equal to 6 pi uh, r neta into v where r is basically the radius neta is the viscosity uh, of the liquid <coughs> v is the velocity or the terminal velocity of uh, movement of the particle all right so i hope that these uh, terminologies are now clear to you so if we rearrange this uh, we we can get that 4 by 3 pi r cube into gamma s minus gamma w becomes equal to 6 pi neta r into v so if we just uh, do some calculations here uh, we can write that 2 by 9 uh, r square because 1 r from here will get cancelled here. So, r square into gamma s minus gamma w pi will also get cancelled uh, becomes equal to neta into v or v is basically equal to 2 by 9 2 by 9 uh, r square. So, r I can write as d by 2. So, the becomes d square by 4 uh, into 1 by 1 by neta into gamma s minus gamma w. So, the final expression for terminal velocity becomes equal to uh, d square by 18 neta into gamma s minus gamma w. Okay. So, this is the basic equation we are looking at. Now, if the velocity is constant, let us say at time t, at t equal to t, this particle has moved to a height of h e from the surface. All right. So, the, the speed I can substitute as h e by t becomes equal to d square by 18 neta gamma s minus gamma w. Uh, so, this is again another expression available with me. Now, in this particular expression, if few of the things become constant. For example, if the suspension which I am taking is a single suspension, so neta for that at a particular temperature will be constant. So, the viscosity of the uh, suspension uh, or the solution at a particular temperature will be constant. Gamma s is the if I am using a similar material. So, the value of gamma s for that particular material is also constant. Gamma w is constant anyway. So, these are all temperature dependent, but I am assuming that the temperature has been fixed. So, therefore, the value of H e by T can be written as uh, d square into a big K. This K is a constant which is basically equal to gamma s minus gamma w by 18 eta. From this analysis, we get a relationship uh, between the uh, height of fall of that particular particle at any time t with the value of d. That means, that if I know he at any time t, I can know that what size of particle is present at that particular location. Alternatively, if I know the size of the particle, so I can determine that at any time t, what is the uh, effective height at which it will reach uh, during the flow. All right. So, I hope again, uh, you know these uh, uh, concepts are clear to you, this derivation is clear to because we will use uh, this idea uh, while understanding about the uh, hydrometer analysis and its use in the calculation of uh, percent passing 75 micron sieve or developing the uh, sieve size distribution curve for the materials passing 75 micron sieve. Once we know this concept, let us try to understand it uh, you know uh, uh, further that in a soil suspension, the particles of different sizes will settle down at different speeds. All right. So, you can understand if it is a soil suspension, then we will have particles larger size, smaller size, smaller size, medium size. 
So, if you see this particular uh, relationship, you can understand at that the height at which the particle will reach is a direct function of the size of the particle. So, at any given time uh, t, the depth of particle of larger dia will be more than the depth of particle of the smaller dia. In other words, the speed at which the particle of larger size will fall will be higher than the speed at which the particle of smaller size will fall, is not it. So, I hope that this is uh, this is clear to you. So, uh, and, and we will be using uh, these concepts as I said as we discuss further, uh, but before that let me try to uh, point out uh, some of the um, limitations of using Stokes law, because these limitations will directly affect the result of the sieve size distribution curve which we are going to derive and or which we are going to understand. So, if I want to point out some of the limitations uh, of the sedimentation analysis which uh, is based on the concept of Stokes law. So, you know one of the uh, problem is that uh, particles are not spherical, because my derivation was based on the assumption that the particles are spherical, but smaller particles especially clay particles which we also discussed in the last presentation are usually not uh, spherical, they are more flattened in shape. So, again this assumption is going to cause some of the error in the final result we are going to derive. Uh, then the boundaries are not open, which means it is not specifically a free fall. So, we have some defined boundaries. Uh, so, therefore, if a material falls from here, if the material is here, then it may happen that while falling it can strike the edges of the cylinder, because of which there will be disruption in the uh, movement of the flow as per our assumption. All right. So, this can affect the results. Then the third problem is that particles interfere with each other, interfere with each other. So, we have several particles here. So, while moving it may happen that this particle can uh, you know interfere with this particle and then uh, it will uh, accordingly affect the results. Another issue is uh, now these are some specific issues that this method is not applicable for materials greater than 0 0.2 mm, because materials greater than 0 0.2 mm can cause turbulent flow within the solution all, all right. Also this method is not applicable for very small particles specifically when the size is uh, less than 0 0.2 micron. The reason being very small particles uh, lead to the uh, occurrence of Brownian uh, motion, which will further affect the results based on the assumption. All right. uh, however, this limitations we should remember, but we are going to uh, use the same concept in developing the uh, sieve size distribution curve for the fine grain soils. So, now let us move ahead. and. Uh, as I mentioned that this is also called as hydrometer analysis and what is a hydrometer? Hydrometer is an instrument which is used to measure the relative density of any two liquids, which means density of liquid 1 by density of liquid 2. Now, since the reference liquid for in our case is water, we also call it as specific gravity. So, we can say that hydrometer is basically used to measure the specific gravity of a particular solution we are interested in. Okay. So, this is how the hydrometer looks like. I also have the hydrometer with me uh, just for some ready reference for you. So, which is very similar to the one which you see in the picture. So, you see this hydrometer uh, has basically two parts. It has the stem and it has the bulb. All right. So, and there are markings in this hydrometer which you can see here, which is also shown in this particular um, picture uh, in this slide. All right. And then you, you can see some mass here. So, this mass is basically the ballast material. This can be made up of mercury and or, or lead. So, this is used basically to, to make the hydrometer stable. All right. So, this is used for stability. So, this is how the uh, hydrometer looks like and these readings basically in the hydrometer are used to directly calculate the specific gravity of that particular solution. 
uh, which we are trying to analyze. So, I hope that the visualization of hydrometer is now clear to you. Now, few things to remember. Now, this also depends on the type of hydrometer we are using, uh, but most of the time uh, the reading of the hydrometer is noted as R. When I say that reading is noted as R, so R is not directly the specific gravity of the material uh, we are analyzing. Okay? So, specific gravity is equal to 1 plus R by 100. So, this is again something we can remember. Some of the hydrometer, uh, the, the reading directly gives us the specific gravity and sometimes we use the value of R rather than specific gravity to uh, note the reading of the hydrometer, which means when we will be noting the reading of the hydrometer, the reading will be basically S g minus 1 divided by uh, multiplied by 1000. So, in order to get the specific gravity, I have to use this particular formula if I have the reading of the hydrometer. One more important thing about hydrometer is that the specific gravity we measure is basically at the center of the bulb, at the center of the bulb. So, uh, we are measuring the specific gravity of the solution or any material of interest at this position. Okay? So, again this is something which we have to remember about the hydrometer and this is how the hydrometer is calibrated. Uh, in our case, we are basically not trying to measure the specific gravity uh, of the solution here, but we are going to use this procedure to evaluate the particle size distribution based on the concept of sedimentation analysis. All right. So, now let us look at the steps that are involved in the process of or evaluating the particle size distribution. All right. So, uh, today we will stop here and I uh, want you to remember this particular slide which we are discussing. Uh, we will start our discussion right from this particular point and we will see the steps that are involved uh, in using the hydrometer for uh, analyzing or for uh, evaluating the particle size distribution curve uh, for the fine grained soils. Thank you.